Tenerife airport disaster. It was supposed to be just another sunny Sunday in Tenerife. But March 27, 1977 became the darkest day in aviation history. After a bomb exploded at Gran Canaria Airport, dozens of flights were rerouted to the tiny Los Rodeos Airport in Tenerife, including two fully loaded Boeing 747s from KLM and Pan Am. The airport wasn't built for this kind of traffic. With planes crammed onto the taxiway, crews were forced to use the actual runway just to move around. It was a logistical nightmare, and then came the fog. Visibility dropped to nearly zero. The control tower didn't see the runway, and they had no radar to track the planes on the ground. In this tense environment, the KLM captain, under pressure from duty time rules and anxious to leave, misunderstood a vague transmission as permission to take off. The Pan Am crew, still taxiing on the same runway, realized something was wrong and tried to warn the tower. But radio interference jammed their message. The KLM crew never heard it. At 5.06 p.m., the KLM jet roared down the runway at full power. The Pan Am pilots saw lights rushing at them through the fog and desperately tried to turn off. It wasn't enough. The KLM's left engine and landing gear smashed into the Pan Am, slicing through the fuselage. The collision ignited KLM's full fuel tanks, topped off earlier to save time and money, creating a fireball that consumed both planes. All 248 people on the KLM flight were killed. Only 61 made it out alive from the Pan Am jet. In total, 583 lives were lost in under 60 seconds. The tragedy forced the entire industry to wake up, leading to stricter communication rules and emphasize English as the common cockpit language. Korean Airlines Flight 007 In the early hours of September 1st, 1983, Korean Airlines Flight 007 took off from New York packed with 269 people, among them U.S. Congressman Larry McDonald. After a refueling stop in Anchorage, the Boeing 747 lifted off again, heading for Seoul. But somewhere between takeoff and cruising altitude, the flight crew made a fatal mistake. Their navigation system stayed in the wrong mode. A tiny oversight, something most passengers would never even hear about, slowly pulled the jumbo jet off course. And not just by a little. It drifted over hundreds of miles, straight into the most sensitive area of Soviet airspace. The Cold War wasn't just tense. It was paranoid. Recent U.S. reconnaissance flights had the Soviets rattled. When KAL-007 entered Soviet airspace, they scrambled MiG-23 fighter jets to intercept it. It wasn't easy. Radar went down. Communications were a mess. And by the time they caught up with the 747, it had already crossed over Kamchatka and neared Sakhalin Island. The Soviet pilot, Major Gennady Osipovich, saw the blinking lights and passenger windows. He knew it was a civilian aircraft. But his orders weren't to investigate. They were to eliminate. He fired two air-to-air -air missiles. The plane was cruising at 35,000 feet when it was struck. Instead of an immediate explosion, the aircraft climbed another 1,000 feet in a strange arc. For nearly two minutes, the crew struggled, likely unaware of what hit them. The 747 briefly stabilized at around 16,400 feet before going into a fatal spiral over the Sea of Japan. All lives were lost. The Soviets denied responsibility, then admitted it and tried to justify the shootdown. The backlash was worldwide. In its wake, the US made GPS accessible to civilians to ensure such a tragedy would never happen again. American Airlines Flight 11 On the morning of September 11, 2001, American Airlines Flight 11 lifted off from Boston Logan Airport bound for Los Angeles. On board were 92 people, including Emmy winner Frasier creator David Engel and actress Barry Berenson. The plane wasn't even half full. Oddly enough, Seth MacFarlane had a ticket too, but missed the flight after oversleeping. That single mistake likely saved his life. 15 minutes after takeoff, everything changed. Five Al-Qaeda operatives launched a violent takeover. Two flight attendants were attacked. Daniel Lewin, a former Israeli Special Forces officer sitting in business class, was stabbed to death, likely the first victim of the 9-11 attacks. The cockpit was overrun. Mohammed Atta, a trained pilot and the mission leader took control of the aircraft. At first, air traffic controllers thought it was a technical issue, but then Atta's voice crackled through the radio, mistakenly broadcast to the tower, we have some planes, just stay quiet and you'll be okay. Flight attendants Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney managed to call American Airlines. Despite their injuries and fear, they calmly relayed real-time details, stabbings, blood, and a suspicious device with colored wires that looked like a bomb. F-15 fighter jets launched from Otis Air National Guard Base, but they were too far behind. At 8.46 a.m., 
Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at roughly 440 miles per hour. The nose hit the 96th floor. 10,000 gallons of jet fuel exploded on impact. Everyone on board died instantly. Inside the tower, hundreds were either incinerated or trapped above the crash site. The North Tower stood for another 102 minutes before collapsing. The death toll from Flight 11 in the North Tower exceeded 1,600 lives, the single deadliest terror act in history. The world would never fly the same way again. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 It was just past midnight on March 8, 2014, when Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 lifted off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport bound for Beijing. On board were 239 people, families, friends, workers, tourists, a regular red-eye flight that should have landed by dawn. But 38 minutes after takeoff, the routine broke. Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah, a veteran pilot with over 18,000 hours in the sky, radioed his last known words. Good night. Malaysian 370. Then, silence. The plane's transponder cut out, severing its link to civilian radar. But Malaysian military radar still picked it up, showing something completely unexpected. The aircraft made a sharp U-turn, veering west across the Malay Peninsula. It flew for nearly an hour more, crossing the Andaman Sea before vanishing from all radar contact about 230 miles northwest of Penang. What followed was an unprecedented hunt. At over $150 million, it became the most expensive search in aviation history. The initial focus on the South China Sea shifted dramatically after British satellite firm MRSAT released data showing the plane had been in contact with one of their satellites for nearly seven more hours, through faint, automatic handshakes. Those pings suggested a long, slow journey into the remote southern Indian Ocean. Despite scouring 46,000 square miles of ocean floor, no wreckage was found in the targeted search zones. Only scattered debris, confirmed to be from Flight 370, washed up on beaches in places like Reunion Island and Mozambique more than a year later. The Malaysian government's final report in 2018 admitted it couldn't determine what truly happened. No black box, no bodies, no closure. Just a multi-million dollar mystery that turned a Boeing 777 into one of the most haunting disappearances modern aviation has ever seen. And 10 years later, the world is still asking the same question. How does a jet that big just vanish? Line Air Flight 610 We all heard about it. That tragic morning on October 29, 2018. Line Air Flight 610, a sleek Boeing 737 MAX 8, took off from Jakarta bound for Pangkal, Penang. But just 13 minutes later, it vanished from the radar, plunging into the Java Sea. All 189 souls on board were lost. A truly devastating event, especially since that was a brand new aircraft. The initial scramble to find answers was intense. Debris and human remains scattered across a wide sea. About 150 nautical miles across painted a grim picture. The flight data recorder was found two days later, deep underwater, revealing a horrifying truth. Tragically, a diver even lost his life during the recovery efforts. What the black box revealed sent shivers down the spines of the aviation world. A new software feature, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS, was pushing the plane's nose down. Here's the kicker. Boeing hadn't told pilots about it, leaving the line aircrew completely in the dark. It turned out an external sensor, the angle of attack sensor, was miscalibrated due to a botched air repair by a US-based company, sending bad data to MCAS. The same problem had plagued the aircraft on its previous flight, but those pilots managed to recover. This time, however, the constant barrage of false information and the pilots' struggle to override it led to the unspeakable. This crash and another similar one that followed sent shockwaves through the aviation industry, prompting a worldwide grounding of the 737 MAX fleet. The final report pointed fingers at Boeing's design, the FAA certification process, and even maintenance lapses by Lion Air and the company that supplied the faulty sensor. It was a perfect storm of technical flaws and human error, leaving us to wonder how such a modern marvel could lead to such a catastrophic outcome. German Wings Flight 9525 The story of German Wings Flight 9525 is one that chills you to the bone, a stark reminder of the hidden dangers that can exist even in the most secure systems. On March 24, 2015, an Airbus A320-211 departed from Barcelona, Spain, heading to Düsseldorf, Germany, carrying 144 passengers and six crew members. It was a routine flight, or so everyone thought, until 13 minutes after reaching its cruising altitude of 38,000 feet. The aircraft began a rapid, unauthorized descent. The air traffic controller's frantic calls went unanswered, 
and a French military jet was scrambled to intercept. But it was too late. The plane, traveling at a staggering 435 miles per hour, slammed into a mountain in the French Alps, 62 miles northwest of Nice. There were no survivors. The wreckage was scattered across 500 acres, the largest piece no bigger than a car. The investigation uncovered a horrifying truth. The crash was no accident. The co-pilot, 27-year-old Andreas Lubitz, had deliberately caused it. While the captain was out of the cockpit, Lubitz locked the door, overriding the access code, and then programmed the plane to descend. The sounds of the captain desperately trying to re-enter the cockpit, banging on the reinforced door, and Lubitz's steady breathing were all captured on the cockpit voice recorder. Even more disturbing, the screams of the passengers could be heard in the final moments before impact. It was revealed that Lubitz had a history of severe depression and suicidal tendencies, and had been declared unfit to work by his doctor, a fact he deliberately concealed from his employer. He had even practiced setting the autopilot to a low altitude on previous flights. In the aftermath, airlines worldwide grappled with how to prevent such a tragedy from ever happening again, leading to temporary mandates for two crew members in the cockpit at all times, a rule later relaxed. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 July 17, 2014 was supposed to be just another long-haul flight, Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, smooth skies, 298 people on board including kids, scientists, vacationers. But somewhere over eastern Ukraine, that normal flight turned into a global catastrophe. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 didn't crash because of turbulence or a mechanical glitch. It was ripped from the sky by a Buke missile. Just like that, 283 passengers and 15 crew members were gone. No warning, no chance. The missile wasn't fired randomly. Investigators, especially the Dutch Safety Board, traced its path with almost surgical precision. It had been hauled into Ukraine from Russia, specifically from the 53rd Anti-Aircraft Missile Brigade. And just hours after the plane was destroyed, the launcher was hauled back across the border. Clean up on aisle war crime. American and German intelligence agencies already had their suspicions. The Ukrainian government said the same. But Russia? It flat out denied involvement. At first, their media claimed the separatists had hit a Ukrainian military plane. Then they blamed Ukraine itself for shooting down MH17. The story kept shifting like a shell game. Only the stakes were human lives. The people lost weren't just numbers. Two-thirds were Dutch. There were Australians, Malaysians, and folks from seven other countries. Among them, leading HIV researchers heading to an AIDS conference, a beloved Malaysian actress, families returning home. The wreckage was scattered over 19 square miles. Some locals scavenged, others mourned. The site was chaos, and justice? It crawled. But in 2022, a Dutch court finally called it. Three men, two Russians, one Ukrainian separatist, were found guilty of murder. Russia, the court ruled, had control over the separatists at the time. Years of denial couldn't hide the truth anymore. This wasn't just an accident. It was a political killing at 33,000 feet, and the world hasn't forgotten. Air France Flight 447 Air France Flight 447 took off from Rio on June 1, 2009, headed to Paris with 228 people on board. It was supposed to be an overnight haul across the Atlantic, an eventful routine. But above the ocean, at 38,000 feet, things spiraled fast. Ice crystals clogged the plane's airspeed sensors, throwing the readings into chaos. The autopilot clicked off. Now, it was up to the human crew. And that's where everything fell apart. With confusing airspeed data and a sudden shift in flight control mode, the pilot flying made a disastrous move. He pulled the nose up. That's the exact opposite of what you do when you're losing lift. But in the moment, with alarms screaming and no clear sense of what the plane was actually doing, panic took the wheel. The aircraft stalled, and for the next three and a half minutes, it was a slow motion freefall into the Atlantic. Inside the cockpit, the confusion was heartbreaking. The captain rushed in from his rest break to find his two co-pilots locked in a tug of war. One tried to correct the stall by pushing the nose down, but the other kept pulling up, canceling each other out. The plane kept dropping. Stall alarms blared, sink rate warnings echoed, and still, the crew couldn't piece together what was happening. It took nearly two years and millions of dollars to find the black boxes, resting over 15,000 feet beneath the surface. When they were recovered in May 2011, they laid bare the whole nightmare. The final report called out iced over sensors, human error, and a critical gap in high-altitude stall recovery training. This wasn't a mechanical failure alone. It was a moment where human instinct collided with complexity, and it ended in silence, somewhere over the mid-Atlantic. Alaska Airlines Flight 261 
On January 31, 2000, Alaska Airlines Flight 261 lifted off under blue skies, heading from Puerto Vallarta to Seattle with a stop in San Francisco. On board were 88 people, vacationers, business travelers, families, and a crew deeply connected to the airline. At first, everything seemed routine. The MD-83 cruised comfortably at 31,000 feet. But just before 3.49 p.m., the pilots began wrestling with a jammed horizontal stabilizer. What should have been smooth flight now required 10 pounds of constant force on the controls to stay level. They radioed maintenance and mulled over a possible diversion to Los Angeles. What they didn't know was that the heart of their problem, an overworn jack screw, was far more dangerous than anyone realized. That tiny piece of hardware, responsible for moving the stabilizer, hadn't been properly maintained. It was supposed to be checked and lubricated regularly. It wasn't. At 4.09 p.m., the crew tried once more to free the jam. This time, it moved, but the stabilizer overcorrected violently, sending the plane nose first into a rapid dive. In a gut-wrenching 6,000 feet per minute plunge, the pilots managed to stabilize the aircraft around 24,400 feet using sheer strength, 130 to 140 pounds of pulling force. They radioed air traffic control, asking to avoid populated areas. Still fighting to regain full control, they knew they were running out of time. 10 minutes later, The jack screw failed completely. The plane flipped, rolling over the Pacific, visible to horrified pilots in nearby aircraft. In a final act of desperation, the crew tried to fly it inverted. It wasn't enough. At 4.21 p.m., the aircraft slammed into the ocean just 2.7 miles off Anacapa Island. Everyone on board was lost. Investigators later confirmed the unthinkable. A tube of grease and routine maintenance, ignored, had brought down a jet, and with it, 88 lives.